the rich fellows come in their Mercedes and we treat them for one dollar, you know, let them all go to private. Let the government look after the poor. And at that time it seemed, oh, very good, you know, I mean, it's quite, quite a good idea, lah, you know, seemed reasonable, lah, you know. But you no, know, I think we didn't really foresee that when this happened, three quarter of the specialists will go to private, you know. We didn't foresee that enough, you know. So that concept of splitting the healthcare between a private and government has led to the depletion of the government side. It was the, that privatization, uh, using a market, market mechanism to deliver a social good like health. It, this, this is the main cause of it, you know. And now with health tourism and all that expansion of the private sector, it's further, you know, accentuating the problem. When you have Prince Court opening up, let's say Prince Court gets a lot of foreign tourists coming in. They have, they have need for more doctors. They'll just invite people from the government side. People with skill, not the young specialists. The fellows, you know, who have established a name, they'll invite them over, isn't it? And private people, you know, the, the people in the category three can never go to Prince Court, isn't it? See, this happened quite long ago, huh? when you all were probably still in school, <laughs> kindergarten. <laughs> okay, this one, GMS. <laughs> The GMS, General Medical Store, was formerly a section of the Health Ministry. And they were in charge of buying medicine for the whole government sector, for government hospitals, government clinics, everything. They used to buy, you know, so they can bulk buy. And they had laboratories, you know, to test the medicine, whether the medicine is pure, genuine. You know, they had a good system. It's doing quite well. So 1993 or 1992, around that time, uh, Mahadir privatized it, you know, to one of the renowned companies. La. And immediately the price of the next year itself, the, the medical bill la, went up from 200 million to 800 million. And now it's come, now known no, the Pharma Niaga. See, Pharma Niaga's, uh, the share price uh, went up six times between 99 and 2004. Because they privatized it, okay? Then they told the hospitals, you must buy from this fellow, you know. You cannot buy from elsewhere. Even if it's cheaper outside, it cannot. To buy outside, this fellow must give you this pharma. Last time it was known as Renong. It was not Renong, you know. What is it known as? Huh? Remedy. 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 So you, see, you must, Remedy must give you a letter saying, I cannot supply this medicine. Baru, you can buy outside. Even if the medicine that Remedy is quoting to you is more than what the private sells you, you are bound to buy from Remedy. This is the five support services. You know, laundry, uh, rep repairs, um, ward cleanliness, um, sisa, it's um, medical waste, medical waste disposal, and all that. Huh? They were they were privatized to three companies: Faber, Mediserve, Radicare, Tonka. Fourteen years, they were given. Immediately the next year, the price of that sector, that service, went up threefold. The fourteen-year thing is already finished. They have now extended it for another, I think, ten years. Huh, is it? Extended enough for another 10 years. These all, as you know very well, are Faber Mediserve and all these things are, are, are renowned, that's stable, you know. Tonka was Mahade's sons, you know. Mokzani's, isn't it? Huh? Mokzani's company, you know. So you, you do this kind of thing, obviously, cost is going to go up, isn't it? Then you say, I'm going to charge you a health tax, huh? a bit rich, you know. Okay, next one. Hospitals, you know. Previously, JKR built the hospitals, or JKR actually. Now they have all kinds of ideas like turnkey, la, this, la, that. La. And it's very expensive and sometimes they have problems. Like this one is a Joho one. They couldn't operate for a year and a half because of fungus and all that. The one built in, 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 in uh, Alosta had some trouble with the drains and piping. You know, it's a lot of problems, you know. So this is, I think, an endemic problem in government where you, 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 you contract out work at high prices and you get quality which is low. Then you got to do the repair of the thing and all that. Of course, prices go up. La. Of course, the prices of goods, you know, of, of medicines have gone up. You know, the medical technology has gone up. All that also is a factor. But I'll, I'll say that this also is a significant factor why the price of healthcare for the government has gone up. But this, they'll never talk about this, you know. They always talk about aging population, chronic illnesses, advances in medical technology. Memang, all that is true. True. Now we've got CT scan, MRI. Things have gone up, but this, they never talk about this, you know. Next one. So if you look at the last 20 years, you know, this privatization, you know, and, and we see who has benefited. See, government is ending up paying more 
and government assets, uh, the government healthcare system has been, de has been run down. So governments have lost out. Next one. Healthcare workers. If you look at the lower category, uh, the, the manual, manual workers, you know, like cleaners, for example, the people working in the laundry, you know, the ordinary workers, workers in the guard, guard, gardeners and all that. Previously, they were government servants. And every year they'll get you know, the 10, 20 dollar increment. You know, the, the job was, then they had pension at the end. They got government loans to buy a house. They can go to IGN, you know, all these things were there. Now they're all contract, contract workers, you know. Every three years, and this one, Faber Medicine doesn't employ them directly. Faber Medicine actually subcontracts to smaller contractors. And the smaller contractors got to bid every two or three years to retain the jobs. So the competition among contractors makes it certain that all this category of workers will never get regular pay increments. Because if they get pay increments, then the next time they go for a, a, a contract, the new contractor can undercut this fellow, isn't it? So that's, that's the reality now. The last 20 years, this category of workers have remained at the same thing, and they got to compete with Bangladeshi workers, Nepali workers, you know, who also brought in to do the similar kind of work. And there's no job security, there's no pay increment, there's nothing like, you know, no pension. And then, next one. The people ended up with a two-tier, three-tier system. You know, quality of care has gone down, there's a lot of pressure. People are forced to go to government hospitals, though they don't really trust them so much, they force, then they run to private, they lose money there. Uh, the only fellows who gain is the crony companies. La. The last 20 years, really, I mean, look at it objectively. I know, I know I'm an opposition politician, no, but think of it objectively. Who has actually gained? <laughs> you know, all Mahadir's friends, la, you know, who have actually gained, you know. Some other details one care that people are worried about. Eh? Okay. Now, you see, one problem with that, see, one care, the whole system is based on a market model. La. You know, it's a new liberal concept that thinks that people are best guided by economic incentives and disincentives. That's basically a Thatcher, Regan kind of a worldview. La. Okay? So now they say, okay, now we're giving this doctor, okay, let's say David, la, David is a GP, eh? giving 3,000 3, patients to look after. La. So very easy for David, eh? anything, eh? this refer, la. anything, headache or whatever, okay, la, go, go and see the neurologist, go and see the cardiologist, you know? send them up, don't handle at this level. Easy what? Come, write a letter, refer up. So this is won't do, you see, because the idea of having him as a gatekeeper is for him to treat at his level as much as he can. So how do you do that now? So they got a concept, they're going to find. You got 3,000 patients, you can refer a certain ratio, a certain percentage of the patients should be referred. If anything more than that means you're being lazy. So I'll find you. Okay? Now there's a problem. If you happen to be the patient we are reaching his quota for the month and you happen to go with him and, and he wants to refer you but you think, my God, if I refer him now, better keep it next week, next month I can refer him in next month's quota but this month, you know, it will create a certain problem if you have something that re requires an urgent referral but because of this quota and the fining, next one please, you know, you're going to get penalty. So he's going to be paid capitation. Every month he'll get a certain sum of money based on the number of patients he's covering. But if he refers too many, his, that, that pay may be cut. So to, to make sure he does his job properly, la. That's, a, that's the way they were thinking. That's the whole problem, you see. When you start thinking in that terms, huh? so now we're going to have hospitals, you're going to say, let the money follow the patient. So which hospitals attracts patients, gives patients satisfaction, we give the money to them. Okay. But then you have a problem. You can't just go by admission because there are different kinds of admission, right? You're admitted for normal childbirth. You're admitted for a caesarean. Different what? You go with chest pain, but it's a muscular pain or go with chest pain is a heart attack, different one. So they got this concept of DRGs. Next one. Diagnosis-related groups. They're going, now they're going to classify all uh, diagnosis into certain categories in terms of complexity of treatment. If we, get a, if we go for a caesarean section, there'll be a different DRG and a different... So the hospitals all earn money based on your spectrum of cases that you get, not just the number of cases. The number of cases times each case got a weightage. La. Now, if I was a hospital director and I want to get more money from my hospital and buy more equipment and give David his bonus and all that, how do I do that? I got to earn more money. So one way of earning more money is get more patients. Other way is to upgrade the diagnosis. There'll be a tendency to upgrade the diagnosis, right? You know? So again, the same problem of over-treatment, over-investigation may also come up. You know, the hospital knows, let's say, 
if a person comes with chest pain, if I diagnose as an ischemic heart disease and do a number of tests on the patient, I'll get more than I just say it's chest pain and why not? If I do a caesarean for a labor case, I get three or four times more than I do a normal delivery. If I operate and remove the appendix, instead of saying it was only colic and go home. So again, the same problem comes up. So then this NHFA has got to have a team to check this bugger's alarm, make sure this fellow's not taking us for a ride, you know. Can you imagine? They've got to have doctors, they've got to have accountants to try and curtail that. So once you put money into it, see like now government hospitals, this doesn't come in at all. Government hospitals get a global budget, you know, EPO GH, maybe so many million a year. It's fixed based on your previous year's expenditure, just fix it that way. But if, when, you, when your income depends on your diagnosis and what you do, there'll be pressure on the hospital to diagnose up line, you know, and not diagnose down line, you know what I mean? And then it'll be a problem. Okay, next one. You know, so, in, so appendix and not colleagues, caesarean sections, you know. So the, there's a risk of over-investigation, the cost and the bureaucracy. Like. So these are, these are issues, I mean, you're going to have new quirks, you know, if you, if you follow the system, these kind of issues are going to become very quirky, like. you know. You're given a certain sum of money for appendix, that's a DRG. Whether you keep the patient for four days and discharge the patient, or keep the patient for seven days and discharge the patient, the sum of money is the same. Then I'm the hospital director, I want the patient out on day two. Better what? Operator, day two, go home, come back on day seven, remove the stitches, don't stay till, but you know, huh? everything, you know, it depends how the, the, the financing system is worked out, you know. If financing system is worked out like that, you know, they've got a diagnosis, you, you pay that lump sum for the diagnosis, and you don't take into account how long the patient stays after the diagnosis, it's no long, you know, that if you keep longer, you actually spend money on the patient but don't earn, then there'll be a tendency to push patients out. It is going to give a lot of quirks, you know. The, the payment system is going to then affect clinical management and not patient, optimum patient care, you know. It's going to be how the financial system impacts on the girl, you know, you know what I mean? So it's going to be another problem. So you've got to go through this whole thing, you know. I mean, if you have a CVA, uh, 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 let's say a head injury case comes in, comatose, requiring pumping, now how are you going to pay for that? You know? If you're only going to pay a fixed amount, then they've given a fellow there for two weeks on a, on, a ins on, a, on a ventilator, you know, not cost effective. La. If you have a head injury, you must either recover in two, three days, or you must die, la, you know. For the, host for the hospital's point of view, of, of balancing my budget, isn't it? You, you get a head injury, you come in, it'll support you, but you must recover in two days or three days. Otherwise, if I keep on doing that, so the, how you pay is going to make a lot of impact. Because ICU care is bloody expensive. And the system, you know, so it depends. La. And if the system then says, okay, keep any number of days, you'll pay for the number of days, then there's a tendency to keep them for too long. You can wean him off earlier, you don't wean him off early enough because we play, you know what I mean? Once you put money into clinical decisions, then it'll have all kinds of bugs will come out, you know? Bugs will come to the system. Okay? All right, next one. So, so the reforms, the suggested reform based on market, market mechanism, based on money incentives, is already a problem. But I think it's a bigger problem. The bigger problem is who is going to do the reform? They're estimating between 40 to 70 billion. It's going to go up, you know. Once they do this thing, huh? it's going to go up. So, so now, the government health budget is in the hand of the government. La. This 16 billion is not in the hands of the government. They want to make it into one, they're going to take charge of that. Do you trust them? Binoculars. Real price and buying price. <laughs> Remember or not, this one, the Mara fellas bought this night vision binoculars, 2005, right? And they bought it for what, 56,000 or something? Remember or not? Not I saying this, Auditor General said it, right? Huh? Okay, when you can buy something at 20 times the price, and after that, the fellows who did it were not taken to, to, to court. They said it's a mistake, you know, or they made a mistake, they got confused something, you know, isn't it? It was covered up. Next one. This I'm sure you know or not, this is an armored personal carrier. We are buying 257 of these at the cost of 30 million a piece. And the most expensive one in America, the most chunky one you can get in America is 10 million a piece. And we're getting ours from Turkey, you know. 257 of them. 